It comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 11 and going through 13. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. As we consider the amazing Word of God, Hebrews 4 and verse number 12 is certainly a verse we must not overlook. We noted this morning, God uses many different symbols and many different metaphors to describe His Word. These symbols are not only interesting, but they each one teach us something different about the amazing Word of God. We noted that the Bible is referred to as fire. Jeremiah 23, 29. The Bible is referred to as God's hammer. The hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. We noted that the Bible is also referred to as a sword. Ephesians 6, 17. And Hebrews 4, verse number 12. The Holy Spirit uses the Bible, the Word of God, as an instrument. That is the manner that God has chosen for the Holy Spirit to influence the life of a human being. The way the Holy Spirit of God influences a human being is through the powerful, inspired Word of God. Thus it is called the Spirit's sword. Ephesians six seventeen. The idea that the Holy Spirit influences our hearts in some other way besides this is nowhere taught in the Scriptures. And is simply a matter of fantasy. Is simply someone's imagination. The Holy Spirit influences our hearts through the Word of God. Then we saw where the Bible is also referred to as seed. Luke 8, verse 11. The seed is the Word of God. When we think about seed, when we notice the creation of God in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible teaches us that every seed reproduced after its own kind. That is also true in the spiritual world. The seed, the Word, is the seed of the kingdom. Luke calls it, in Luke 8 verse 11, the Word of God. Matthew calls it the Word of the kingdom. Thus, it is seed for the kingdom. When we plant seed in the honest heart, it can only produce simple Christians. This seed cannot produce different denominations. It can only produce after its own kind. For us to produce a denomination, we must add denominational teaching to the seed. You could not have a Mormon simply by taking the Bible. You could not have a Baptist simply by taking the Word of God. You've got to add the Bible plus the Baptist manual. You've got to have the Bible plus the Book of Mormon to create a Mormon. 
the Word of God does not produce different denominations. It simply produces New Testament Christians. In Hebrews 4.12, we noted this morning that it's referred to here as a sharp, fine-cutting instrument. A two-edged sword. But look at the first part of the verse. Tonight I want us to look at the first part of this verse. The Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, is quick and powerful. The word quick means alive, living. John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There is life in the Word of God. It brings life to the sin-sick soul. 2 Timothy 3.15, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Scriptures bring eternal life. John 6, verse number 68. John 6, verse 68. Peter said to Jesus, You have the words of eternal life. Think about that. Words of eternal life. That's what's found in the Bible. And yet, how how many Americans and how many Christians spend more time watching television than studying the Bible? More time with entertainment than diligent study of the Bible, and yet... In the Bible, we find words of eternal life. So Hebrews 4.12 says this book is living. It's not a dead letter. It doesn't, as some preachers have said, it's merely informational. It's not merely informational. These words contain life. Because these words come from God. So Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick. That means living and powerful. Think about the power of the Word of God. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Think of all the bombs and missiles of the United States of America. They cannot convert even one soul. All of our military might cannot even forgive one person of sin. And yet the words of God are so powerful. John 15 verse 3, Jesus said, Now are you clean to His closest disciples through the Word which I have spoken unto you. John 15 verse 3. So these words are not only living, these words are powerful. The word translated powerful in Hebrews 4.12 is an interesting Greek word. It actually means operative. The Word of God will do what God intends for it to do. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, what Paul said to the Thessalonian Christians, the Word of God effectively works in you that believe. It works. It does what God wants it to do. That's what the word means. Operative. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 8, You remember that the old prophet of God said, as God spoke through him, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and your thoughts, and my ways and your ways. And then he explains how the rain and the snow comes down from heaven. And because of that, vegetation is the result for food for the human race. And then in verse 11, he makes this point. That's the way it is with the Word of God. 
so it is with my word. It will accomplish the purpose whereunto I have sent it. Isaiah 55 verse 11. God's Word will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish because it is so powerful. Did you know the Bible is also spoken of as a mirror? Look in your Bible in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, James used this fascinating metaphor to describe the Word of God. He said, be you doers of the word and not hearers only, James 1.22, deceiving your own self. For the one who's simply a hearer and not a doer, he says he's like a man who looks at his face, his natural face in a mirror and just immediately walks away and forgets what manner of person that he was. But look at verse 25. But whosoever looketh unto the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The Word of God is seen as a mirror. Now, all of us know what mirrors are. We use them every day. Of course, in the first century, they were not as refined as they are today. They were often just a piece of metal or a little piece of glass. They didn't give the true reflection like they do now. Of course, you can pay $50,000 for a car, and the mirror says objects are not the size as they appear. Wouldn't you think if you paid that much for a vehicle, they could get you a mirror that would show you something like it really is? Isn't that kind of disgusting? But our mirrors have improved since the first century. And what are they for? They show us imperfections. Our women stand before them hours and hours every day. Why? To paint imperfections. And I'm not against this. I'm I'm glad they do that. I think it's nice. That's what a mirror does. It shows you the imperfections. And you do what you can to improve. Now, I've found as you get older, there's less and less you can do. But they show us what is wrong. They show us what we need to correct. They show us an image of ourselves. Well, as a physical mirror shows you the image of a physical person, God's spiritual mirror, the Bible, shows us an image of the inner person. The Bible shows us what we are really like on the inside if we have the courage to honestly look at it. Of course, most people want to make excuses. I do the best I can. I'm better than most people. It's my parents' fault. It's his fault. It's church's fault, the preacher's fault, the elder's fault. They don't want to look into that mirror and see what's really there. But if we honestly look into the mirror of God's Word, we'll see the truth. We'll see what we really are spiritually. Thus, we can see what we need to improve. How we need to become more like the Lord in certain aspects of our lives. So it's a beautiful mirror. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's used in a different way. Paul said, We all with open face behold as in a mirror the image of the Lord, and we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We look into this mirror, the New Testament, and we see this image of Jesus. And we are to become like that image. Thus we partake of the divine nature. We become more like Christ because we see His image in that powerful Word and we become like Him. Did you know that God describes His Word as light? Psalm 119 verse 105. The psalmist said, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light 
unto my path. Now in ancient times, their streets were not as well lit as our streets are today. And their streets were often very narrow. And of course, they didn't have all this machinery that we have, even though they tell us that our infrastructure is crumbling, that our highway system is in horrible disrepair. It's still the best in the world. But they didn't have all of this to help them to make the streets like we do. So the streets were often quite bumpy, and often there were holes and you could fall. And so they would carry a little light, and it was a little candle-like uh, a little candle-like thing that they would hold down so they could see the street. Since the streets were not well lit, you couldn't even see where you were walking. So it was very important that you have this light. I remember the first time I went to Jamaica and went up high up on this mountain and people were coming to services all down on the top of this mountain and every one of them had a little flashlight because the streets weren't lit. That was very important. In this ancient time, it was important you have this light to walk down the street. Or you're going to run into something. Or you're going to fall. That's what he's saying in Psalm 119, verse 105. God's Word, it is a lamp to our path. It shows us the way. Without it, we are going to stumble and fall and we're going to make so many mistakes and we're going to get so messed up in life. And how many people in, in America live their entire lives without the light of the Bible? Isn't that a shame? That how, how, how many citizens of our great country live their entire lives and never have the light of the Bible to show them the true way? But God's people are different. We have the light of God. We can see how we ought to live. We can see how we ought to go from day to day. We can see how we ought to talk, how we ought to behave, how we ought to be living in this sinless and godless world because we have the lamp of God. He said, it is a light to our feet. Psalm 119, verse 105 so that we don't fall in all of those holes that the devil has laid for us. So all those traps that Satan has laid for each one of us, we don't fall into those. Because we have the light that's guiding our feet. It's guiding our way. Isn't it a shame that many Christians don't spend any time studying the Bible? How can they go about this life and live a life that pleases God when they don't have any light to show them the way? We all need to be shown the way, and that's what the Bible is for. God refers to His Word as food. You thought about that? Matthew 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You have a soul inside of your body that's made in the image of God. That soul is going to live forever. It's the greatest possession you have. It has to be fed. It has to be nourished. It has to be cared for. And yet, how many Christians starve their souls to death because they spend so little time studying the Bible? What a shame. The Bible's at our very reach. It's in every home, on every bookshelf, and yet how often is it so neglected for such trivial things? This is a way that will show us our way to heaven. God's Word is referred to as everlasting. 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. 
Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. When I hear all these people on the History Channel criticizing the Bible and saying it has mistakes all in it, did you know when all these great universities have crumbled into dust and all this wisdom of men mean nothing? The Bible will still be here. The Word of God will endure because it is everlasting. And that everlasting seed tells you you must be born again, that you must turn from your sins, that you must be immersed to have those sins forgiven, and then that new life begins, a life with God, a life you can begin right now while we stand and while we sing. Thank <clears throat> you.